I will be reading 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 4 through 13. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse has seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Thank you, Dylan, for that reading and Lee for leading us in those songs of praise. Uh, we again want to extend a welcome to all who are with us today, especially if you are a guest of ours, maybe here for the first time. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today to spend this time in praise to our God. And we would encourage you, if possible, to stay for our period of Bible classes that follow. And if you need some help getting to that class, uh, just ask anyone around you. And if they can't help you, they will find someone who can. Uh, among the many groups who are in and out this summer are our mission teams, and currently we have a, a team of workers in Belize. Uh, it looked like on Friday that they weren't going to be able to go because of some regulations and prohibitions sent down from the, uh, the, the Ministry of Health there. Uh, but through some prayer and connections and phone calls, uh, they were able to go ahead and make the trip and so continue to pray for them on a daily basis that all goes well. Uh, we do have the joy this morning of welcoming uh, two new families to the Fellowship of God's People here at the Broken Arrow Church. Our uh, John and Denise story here. And if you are, would you please stand up for just a second? Let me see where you are. <laughs> I'm sorry, Stacy, not story. Uh, <laughs> Denise, it's good, great to have you here. And uh, along with them, who are coming from the Crosstown Church, are Jerry and Cheyenne Sorrell and their children, Taylor, Taylor, Raleigh, and Jonna, would you guys stand for just a moment, please? Let everybody see where you are. Uh, we are thrilled to have this extended family uh, join us here at the Broken Arrow Church. And if you haven't yet met them, I, I know in talking to Denise the other day, they have multiple connections in the congregation already that uh, extend back many, many years. And so we do welcome you and look forward to work, working with you in uh, the service of Christ here. As we welcome two new families, we're also saying goodbye to a family today, I believe. Uh, Andy, is that correct? Is this your last Sunday with us? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. All right. You've got a week left uh, to spend some time with Andy and Delora and Reese. Has it been a couple of years now that you've been with us? Uh, we appreciate your uh, encouragement, your faithfulness, your involvement uh, that began immediately upon your arrival. So uh, our prayers go with you along with our love and uh, best wishes during this transition and in your search for a, a new church home there. There are two weeks left at uh, New Heights Summer Camp, and I know that there are still some volunteer slots that could be filled. Uh, Colleen is away with the Belize Mission Group, and so if you could help out in any way, contact Melissa Gillen or uh, call the office and whoever is here. Uh, can help get you directed where your talents and gifts and energy can be put to work. Uh, life groups meet today. If you'll check the insert in your bulletin, you'll notice that we have numerous life groups meeting in different places this afternoon and this evening. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry, you can talk to me or Patrick Edison or Lee or uh, one of the elders. Anyone you see would be happy to help uh, you learn more about this ministry. 
since it's Life Group Sunday, that means we're back to the Cloud of Witnesses study. And every time that I think I'm getting close to wrapping this series up, if you're counting, this is the 19th lesson in this series uh, that we've hit just once a month. Every time I think we're getting close to wrapping it up or needing to wrap it up, I look down and I see one more on the list that was suggested by you that we haven't gotten to yet, and so I say one more month. Uh, where will be Life Group Sunday next month? I can't tell you as far as our study, but today we're sticking with the cloud of witnesses. And if I had told you that the subject of our study today was John, uh, you would be justified in asking some questions about that. Do you mean John the baptizer, uh, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, or do you mean John the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, who becomes an apostle of Jesus Christ and is later known by church history as the apostle of, of love? We've got more than one John that we would have to sort out there. Same thing with James. If, if I said the subject of our study was James, you would ask, well, is that James the brother of John, the son of Zebedee? Uh, known as James the Just uh, in church history? Or is this James the brother of the Lord, who becomes a pillar of the church in Jerusalem and uh, writes the epistle of James? And is this powerful leader in the Jerusalem church? Even the name Saul, uh, you might ask some questions about. Are we talking Old Testament or New Testament? Even if I told you he was from the tribe of Benjamin, that wouldn't help because both the Sauls we know, Old Testament and New Testament, are from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, but if I throw out the name David, everybody knows exactly who I'm talking about. We're all on the same page because there's only one of him. Nobody else in the Bible has that name. Old Testament or New Testament. Can't get confused with, with anyone in the Bible. And so he will be the focus of our study this morning. Uh, obviously, there, there's too much about his life and too much about his legacy in Scripture to discuss in full this morning. I feel the pain of the writer of Hebrews, who in chapter 13, verse 30, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 32, says, "And what more shall I say?" That's after he's gone through this litany of people that he will refer to in the beginning of chapter 12 as this great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, who have gone before us in this walk of faith. What more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Notice that he doesn't say space pro uh, prohibits me. He says time fails me, which leads us to believe that what we have as the letter of Hebrews was first put together as a sermon and then written down. Preachers never have enough time to talk about everything they want to talk about. And so it, he's not pressed for space, he's press for time. In chapter 13, near the end, he refers to his letter as this brief word of encouragement. That's 13 long chapters. Only a preacher would call the book of Hebrews a brief word of encouragement. But the writer says, you know, I just don't have time to tell you everything that I would like to tell you about these great men and women. And he includes David in that list. Some of our discussion of David is going to be limited to and restricted to and reserved for our life group discussions. And those of you leaders, co-leaders have already seen that discussion guide. You know the questions we're going to be covering in life groups today. So we'll reserve some of the discussion for then and there. And rather than focusing on a few details from multiple incidents within David's life, or rather than completely unpacking all of the details of a single incident, I want us this morning to focus on what it was about David and his heart that made him so pleasing to God. You know, Saul, who is David's predecessor on the throne as Israel's first king, uh, he's also going to become David's boss, and after that, he's going to become David's father-in-law, and after that, he's going to be a would-be assassin of David on multiple occasions. Uh, Saul had a heart for Saul. He had a heart for Saul, and that was his undoing. That's why, what led God to look for someone else. In the beginning, Saul was humble enough. 
he had enough recognition about who he was in relation to who God was. And on coronation day, when Samuel was looking for him to anoint him as Israel's first king, he can't be found. He's too embarrassed, too bashful, too humble, if you will, to even come out and appear before the people. Give him credit for that. He starts out a humble man. But he doesn't stay that way long. Power does that to people. Authority does that to people. Being able to tell other people what to do, and your word being law, does that to people. And so Saul, rather than being full of God, he gets full of himself. And he takes on priestly roles that he doesn't need to take on. And he begins to think that he has a better plan for people like the Amalekites than God does. And starts substituting his will for God's will. And so because of that uh, occasion of offering sacrifice, Samuel says to him, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, Samuel said to Saul, you've acted foolishly, you've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now the kingdom shall not endure, your kingdom shall not endure The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And Saul, that's not you. You're a man after your own heart. You seek yourself. You are full of yourself. But the Lord seeks for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Over in chapter 15, after his failure with the uh, Amalekites, Verse 28, this is after Samuel starts to leave and Saul reaches out and grabs his cloak and rips it. Accidentally tears the robe of the prophet. So Samuel says, okay, Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. So what makes David better than Saul? What makes David a man after God's own heart when Samuel was not. God was looking for someone whose spiritual heartbeat was in sync with the heartbeat of God, whose breath was connected with the breath of God, whose will was connected with the will of God, who loved the Lord, was devoted to Him, trusted in Him, whose confidence and hope were in the Lord. Oh, so God was looking for a perfect man as Israel's second king. No. The perfect man's not going to come along for a for quite some time. There's a place and a role and a time for the perfect man, but it's not now. He's looking for David. So what is it about imperfect David, sinful David, struggling David, sometimes fearful David, that makes him a man after God's own heart when Saul was not? I think the key, one of the keys, is his faithfulness. From the little things to the big things. Don't read flawlessness. Don't read perfection when I say faithfulness. Doesn't work that way for us either. Doesn't work that way for me. I'm assuming it doesn't work that way for you. If you're a faithful Christian, you're not making a claim to flawlessness. I hope you're not. Hope you're not making a claim to perfection. Faithfulness is not flawlessness. Flawlessness belongs to God. The perfect man is Jesus Christ. But David, as we are too, demonstrates this faithfulness, beginning with the little things. When he was completely off the stage, when he was simply keeping the sheep of his father Jesse near the village of Bethlehem. No spotlight, no limelight. He serves faithfully and he he serves most of the time fearlessly. But it's a rather mundane job. It's not very glamorous. Some days he had to ward off lions and bears, but not on a daily basis. Most days weren't that exciting. Most days weren't that eventful to have to face a lion or a bear. But he faithfully does his work. And there's such a great lesson in this, and I think it's one that we need to learn early in life. That whatever is entrusted into your hands, regardless of what that task is that you're given to do, do it well. Do it with integrity. Do it uh, in a way that that demonstrates character and your trustworthiness. Uh, uh, David's son, Solomon, whom we assume to be the preacher 
who writes the book of Ecclesiastes, who calls himself the son of David, the king of Israel. There aren't too many people that can be, but Solomon. He writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Who do you think he learned that from? Probably learned it from his father, either in spoken form or just by observing his father's life. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You find the same principle in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. A few, uh, couple of verses down. It's going to say that really our work is for the Lord Christ. Regardless of what that work is if we are a child of God. And I want to, as much as possible, impress this upon you this morning on those of you who are younger who haven't gotten as far down the line as, as I have and others have and haven't made, made as many mistakes yet as, as we have. Uh, whatever your job is, whatever is entrusted to you, what is ever placed under your responsibility to take care of, do it well. Whether it's just stuff around the house that you're asked to do, chores or jobs that, that your mom or dad gives you, or maybe you have a part-time job at a fast food restaurant or a department store, or maybe you do some babysitting, or maybe you do some lawn work for other people, do it well. No matter what that task is, go above and beyond, go the second mile, meet your responsibilities, and then some. And, and sometimes the attitude that, that we can have is, you know, it's just a little job, it's not really that important, but how you do that job is important, regardless of what that job is. In our last lesson from the Luke series, Luke chapter 16, last week we saw this in verse 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing will also be faithful in much. And the converse, that is true as well. Those who aren't faithful in a very little thing aren't going to show much promise in being faithful in much either. And that's how it works in David's life. That's how he gets from being an obscure shepherd outside Bethlehem to being the king of Israel. Uh, psalm 78, which is a long psalm, and I'm having to turn way over here to verse 70. Verses 70 through 72 of Psalm 78. God also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs, and brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. And I don't know if he's talking about the first part or the second part or both parts. I think it's both parts. That just like he had shepherded the sheep of his father with integrity... So he was now shepherding Israel, just as he had led the sheep of his father with his skillful hands, so he was leading them. And this integrity resulted in a pretty serious promotion to go from obscure shepherd to king. And there was, there was some interim work. And in that interim work, he was actually juggling two jobs. He was shuttling back and forth between Bethlehem and Saul, Saul's court, playing his heart to soothe Saul's troubled spirit and was made Saul's armor bearer. And so he's going to Saul's court for a while and then he's going back home and he's juggling these two, two jobs and he's handling all the travel and all the stress of that situation. And he is blessed by God with, with a lot of gifts and abilities. I, I actually, when I read verse 18 of 1 Samuel 16 this week, I thought, well, this probably would have been on his Facebook profile in, in, you know, in some shape or form. I actually found a Facebook profile for King David. I don't know who put it out there. Uh, it's pretty biblical, actually. It, it lists a lot of things about him, but David does have a Facebook page, by the way. Uh, but verse 18 says, uh, then one of the young men said, this is when Saul's looking for someone who has been blessed by God that can help him with this evil troubled spirit that came from the Lord. Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who's a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. And what I love about David is that, that he takes those blessings, those gifts, and those abilities, and he uses them for the praise and the honor and the glory of God. You know, and he wasn't born a skillful musician. He had to work at that. He had to become that. 
And when he achieved that, that level of skill, he employed that to become what 1 Samuel uh, chapter 23, verse 1 refers to him as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Of the 150 psalms that we find in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, 73 of those are written by David. Some say 78 of those are written by David. Take your pick, that's a lot of psalms. And so as this skillful musician who had worked hard at his craft, he offers that in praise of God, in honor and glory of God, and we still sing some of his work today, taking some of our hymns from the very words that he wrote. Uh, he didn't just become prudent in speech by accident. It's something he had to be conscientious about. And, and most important in that profile in verse 18 of chapter, uh, chapter 16 is this phrase, the Lord was with him. Because if the Lord hadn't been with him, and if David's heart hadn't been with the Lord, none of this other stuff would have mattered. The skillful musician part, the prudent in speech part, the, the mighty warrior part. If the Lord hadn't been with him and his heart hadn't been with the Lord, we would not know David. Nothing ever would have been written about him. He never would have succeeded Saul as king. God would have found another way to bring the Messiah into the world from Abraham through the tribe of Judah. God would have figured out another plan. He didn't have to have David. But because David was the, the kind of man that he was, God used him in a mighty way. And again, just as an encouragement to you younger ones, he, he didn't let his age get in the way. You remember the story, and we don't have time to tell it, about you know, this Philistine champion, Goliath, nine foot, nine inches tall, who comes out twice a day for 40 days and challenges the army of Israel uh, to settle this one-on-one. -on -one. No need to let our armies fight expend all the, these weapons, lose all these lives. Let's just settle it here and now, one on one. You send whoever you want, we'll fight it out. If I win, you become our servants. If he wins, we become your servants. It's that simple. Eighty times he issues that challenge. Nobody takes him up. Too afraid because like Saul, they're, they're full of themselves and don't trust in the power of the Lord. But David comes and he's incensed by this uncircumcised Philistine and the taunts and the ridicule and the blasphemy that he's tossing out against the God of Israel. So he says, I'll go. And you remember Saul's, the, the, the king's response to him. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're, you're just a youth. Just a youth. That's the way Jeremiah felt when God called him. Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Don't say that. Don't say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you, uh, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you. That's the key. I'm with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. That's where your trust is. That's where your confidence is. That's where your assurance is. Not in your own wits or wisdom or knowledge or talent or ability, but in the word that the Lord puts in your mouth. So Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, and that would have been enough, but notice the positives here. But rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Be the kind of young Christian so that if anybody asks who doesn't know what does a Christian look like, how does a Christian behave, how does a Christian talk, that you can be that example of what a Christian is in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Um, that's what a believer in Jesus looks like. And know that you can and know that, that many of you already are making an impact on other people with your faith and, and with your service. I can't pick the individuals out right now, but I know some of you went to Conifer. 
I know some of you went to Ukraine. I know some of you are in Belize right now, and I can't see them for that reason uh, because they're away. Some of you have been volunteering with New Heights. You're helping out with Vacation Bible School. Uh, you're working with the middle schoolers and out of Eden and the Timothy class. Our interns are having such an impact for Christ this summer. So don't let anyone say and don't you dare think it yourself that, that I'm, I'm just a youth. I'm just a kid. Uh, I'm just a youth group Christian. No, you're not. You're a Christian. Uh, as much as I am, as much as your parents are, as much as anybody in this church is, you are a child of God. So do like David and trust in the Lord for your strength. Uh, he knew that it was not his skill that delivered him from the lion and the bear, but the power of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Jesus says in John 15, 5, Apart from me you can do nothing. That's humbling. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, not by my wits and wisdom and strength, but through him who gives me strength. And throughout all of those 73, 78, if you want to take that number, Psalms that, that David wrote, he continually expresses his faith that it was the Lord who was his rock and his fortress and his shield and his strength. And many of those Psalms are written in a time of distress, a time of trouble, a time of frustration, a time of fear, a time of doubt. David lets us know, among many things, that there's nothing wrong. In fact, he encourages us, our God encourages, encourages us to bring the worst of life before him. The failures, the fears, the struggles... Uh, eight psalms he writes when he's running from Saul, fearful for his life. And then he writes Psalm 18 after that thread is gone. This is also found in 2 Samuel chapter 22. But beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 18, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of ungodliness terrified me, the cords of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. There's so much more. Uh, that we'll be able to talk about in, in the life group meetings, how he takes the battle to Goliath, his friendship with Jonathan, his refusal to take personal vengeance against Saul, uh, the preparations that he makes to build the house of the Lord, even though his son will carry out that work. He builds it upon the legacy and foundation that, that David had made. So he's a man after God's own heart because he's perfect, you know, because he perseveres. Because he's flawless? No, because he's faithful. And when ultimately confronted with his sin, which David had plenty of those, his adultery with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, his lie that he told the knob that resulted in 85 priests losing their lives, and David later says, that's my fault. I caused that to happen. But when confronted by Samuel about his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah by telling that powerful parable, when it sinks in, David just says, I've sinned against the Lord. This afternoon, as you have time, just maybe write it down on a piece of paper right now or make a note in your Bible to read Psalm 51. We don't have time to do it this morning. But that's David's prayer for forgiveness. To be cleansed of sin, to have a, a, a pure in clean heart, an undefiled spirit. And then in Psalm 32, he writes about the joy and the blessing of forgiveness. And you'll have the opportunity to discuss that in, in your life groups as well. As we close, I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus as your spiritual champion. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Hebrew word that's translated champion, that describes Goliath who came out, representing the Philistines, is the Hebrew word ish habanayim. And it literally means a man between the two. 
a man who will stand between two opposing forces and will battle, will fight. Jesus is our spiritual Ishabaniam. He stands between God and Satan. And he went to battle for us and accomplished and gained a victory that, that we had no hope of winning. He, he stared down death and won. He wrestled with the evil one in Sheol, the realm of the undead, and was brought back by the power and the glory of the Father, overcoming sin, overcoming Satan, overcoming death, overcoming hell for us. And it's in him that we trust. It's in him that we place our faith and our assurance. And if you need to do that this morning by confessing your faith in him as the Son of God, by acknowledging a desire, not only in your heart, but in your life, to turn from sin and begin walking in the steps of Jesus, and to be united with him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, to let him win that battle for you that you can't win by yourself. Or if you have some other need that you would like the shepherds of the congregation to um, pray with you about in this congregation, to join in prayer with you, whatever your need may be, we ask you to come. Let's stand and sing.